myself. A little bit of fatherly. That God has orchestrated wonderfully today for a part I was going to preach about. But God led him to that song several weeks ago. But God has something to say to us today, and I really believe that. I've entitled today's message, Undressed. When we begin life, it's so beautiful. It's so unspoiled. There are no inhibitions. There's no fear. There's no shame. I I remember that about each of our daughters as they were born. And, And I think about, I remember how as infants... I I had the privilege of, you know, bathing them and and just what it is to hold that that newborn child there in that that little basin and just kind of gently wash them and clean them. And and then I remember how as as toddlers, you know, I I could help them undress and get in the tub and then kind of coach them as they they bathe themselves to make sure they were learning how to clean everywhere that needed to be clean and and I remember how they'd love to get out of the tub when that was over and then run around, right? <laughs> run around kind of free before we had to get back into the diapers or the clothes or, or whatever it was. And I remember that smile that was on their faces when they got to do that. It's like, yeah, you know, I'm free. And, and you remember how your kids like to be undressed, don't you? Sure you do. In fact, you liked that too when you were a kid. No shame, just pure, uninhibited love of life. But then I remember that there came a time they got a little bit older that dad wasn't welcome at bath time anymore. And I remember that there was no more running around the house after the bath and before the clothes. They didn't want to be undressed anymore, even when nobody was around the house. Somewhere along the line, I guess all of us somehow begin to attach feelings of shame and vulnerability with being undressed. Those things kind of get connected. And I'm I'm sure that most of us, if not all of us in our adult lives, have had some perhaps rather embarrassing clothing moments, right? Like, like, you know, when you bend over... (laughs) And, and, and the seam splits, right? Now, it's not because, you know, those clothes, you know, well, I'm not even going to go there. But anyway, you know how the seam splits. And it, it's not good. In fact, I, I had that happen to uh, one of my suits on Sabbath. And I didn't have anything to change into. Needless to say, that Sabbath was rather stressful as I tried to make sure that I was always facing everybody, you know. (laughs) But ever since Adam and Eve sinned, nakedness and shame have gone together. And God gave them clothes to take away their shame. And God wants to give us clothes to take away our shame. But I have a question. Is it possible that we are undressed in a spiritual sense? Is it possible that we're undressed even in church? You know, I think that for the most part, probably all of our physical clothing fails have been unintentional But are we in danger of being intentionally, spiritually undressed? Father God, I just believe in all that's happened today that that you have something important that you want to tell us. That, That you're here with us, that you're near to us. And God... I just pray that you would take this broken, naked, humble vessel and somehow speak through me with the power of your word, Lord, because your word is power. Your life resides in your word. Your presence 
resides in your word. Your creative energy is there. And so today, God, just take the story of Jesus that we look at and do an amazing work that I know you're here to do in each one of our lives. I thank you for hearing this prayer because I ask it in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. I'd like to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. We're going to start out, we're going to go through this whole story, but we're going to look at the first seven verses to get going. And, and, and remember we're doing this Game Changer series. Remember what a Game Changer is? The definition that we've been sharing with you over the course of this series is that it's a person or an idea that causes a radical shift in the manner of thinking about or doing something. And so I want you to keep that in mind as, as we look at this story. And here in Matthew 22, it's the week of the crucifixion. It's the final week of Jesus' life. This is probably happening on Tuesday when Jesus tells the story. And, and what's happening here is that Jesus realizes his ministry is coming to an end. He realizes that time is really beginning to run out for the Jewish nation. And, and he's trying his best to help the Jewish leaders accept him. He's trying his best to help them avoid being caught undressed. He tells an amazing story. A story that has the rapt attention of everyone that's there listening. And the story goes like this. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said... The kingdom of heaven is like a certain man or a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited. Now remember, these people have already been invited many months prior. And now he's sending out his servants to remind them of that invitation. Uh, to call those who were invited to the wedding. And they were not willing to come. Now understand, we've, we've already talked about that, that in Middle Eastern society, the time of Jesus, and, and even now, that shame and honor are the two great driving values in that society. And, and remember that hospitality was one of the, the, the key values and, and that to honor someone you showed them friendship. And when they invited you to come and share with them a meal, you came, because if you didn't, that was the ultimate insult. And understand now, in the context here too, that, that, that for, for the Jews, in talking about the Messianic kingdom, the pleasures of it and the blessings of it and the joys of it were most often compared to a wedding feast. Because a wedding feast was the, the greatest of all events in Jewish society. It was, the, it, it was the biggest celebration, the biggest party. And if you were invited to the king's wedding feast for his son, that was like, wow. It didn't get any better than that. The party didn't get any, any greater. And, and that was the highest honor. And to come spoke of the greatest respect and honor that you were giving the person who gave the invitation. And so understand that Jesus is blowing their minds when he's talking about this king that has this wedding feast and the guests that were invited were not willing to come. Verse 4, Again he sent out other servants saying, Tell those who were invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and, and, and fatted cattle are all killed and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But... They made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. I understand, the people are shocked. They can't even begin to wrap their mind around people actually behaving this way to the king and his invitation, the ultimate insult. But the king, when the king heard about it, he was furious and he sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Understand the symbols here, folks. The king is God the Father. The son that he's making the wedding feast for is Jesus Christ. The wedding feast itself is, is the gospel of salvation. And the original invitees are the Jews. 
Now the servants who gave the original invitation were the Old Testament prophets who brought it. And now the servants who are sent out with that first reminder, they are the disciples of Jesus. And they're John the Baptist and they're Jesus himself uh, during his ministry here on earth. And the other servants that the king sends out in verse 4 after the first set of servants, these are the disciples following the resurrection and ascension of Jesus back to heaven. Now, the big idea, if you're following along in your sermon notes, the big idea in these verse, first seven verses is that God invites us to celebrate a great salvation. God is inviting every one of us to celebrate a great salvation. When sin entered in the world through our first parents, it really messed things up bad. Is that pretty obvious to all of us? really messed things up bad. It put the human race on a one-way road to destruction and Satan became the conductor on the train to oblivion. And because Satan became the prince of this world, he would make sure that we reach that destination. But God made a way out. He provided a way of salvation and He gave us an invitation to the greatest wedding celebration of all time, union with Him and His Son in heaven, the marriage supper of the Lamb. You've read about it in Revelation, haven't you? That's the ultimate wedding celebration that we're talking about here. Now, dear ones, I don't know if this is big on your mind right now, but one of the points I want to make here, one of the first observations is this. We are blessed to be invited to the gospel feast. Isn't that right? We are so blessed to be invited to the gospel feast. We are blessed beyond our imagination that we've not been left to rot in our mess. That we've not been left to be made a plaything by the devil, to be led around like a swine with a ring in its nose to do whatever he wants us to do until he's used us and abused us and then he's ready to destroy us. We are so blessed, amen? We are so blessed to be invited to the gospel feast. Now, furthermore, the other thing you see here is that God himself has provided everything for salvation. Everything. He's provided it. I mean, the king said that the feast was ready. Everything was prepared and waiting on the guests. I mean, the fatted cattle, it was all there. Everything had been done and it was just waiting for them. They didn't have to do anything to enjoy it but to come, right? That's all they had to do. Just show up. Everything else is done for you already. Are you hearing me out there, dear friends? Just show up is what God is saying. When it comes to salvation, all you have to do is show up. The king has already done everything else for you. He's made all the preparations. He's arranged for all the provisions. He has set a place for you at the table. Just show up. That's all you have to do. Hallelujah. That's why we should celebrate, friends. That's why we should walk around every day with some joy and some assurance of our salvation. We can't get into all this, well, I hope I make it. Well, I wonder. God wants us to have some assurance here, and He wants us to celebrate. It's like when I have a birthday. My wife usually surprises me, and and, and what she does is, uh, it's a party, it's a celebration. Now, she... She usually, every year, rotates, but invites some of our closest friends in the church. And I don't know who they're going to be, and, and I don't know where it's going to be, and she won't tell me anything. And she just says, okay, when you're done work, meet me, and gives me an address. And so, so I'm waiting all day long to find out about this, right? And, and, and finally, we, I drive up there, and I get to the place, and, and she usually has done the preparations by means of a restaurant, and, and, and so it's wonderful, and there's a special room, and I walk in, and there's all these special people, well, not a lot, but, but a few, and, and we celebrate, and we enjoy the meal together, and all the work is done, and I just get to show up and enjoy and celebrate, and we don't put candles on the cake anymore. <laughs> but see... The story goes on. Look at this. If you see it in the Word, those who got the original invitation 
what did they do with it? They ignored it. In other words, those most privileged often don't appreciate it. The Bible tells us they wouldn't come. The Bible says they made light of the invitation and the king's servants, and they went on to do other things that interest them more than that. Things, get me now, follow me, things that they could do every day, anytime. Go to my farm. Go to my business. Any day, any time, they could do it. And here's the kicker. Here's the, the mind-blowing thing. They ignored the once-in-a-lifetime chance to be at the prince's wedding feast. Once-in-a-lifetime chance. And I ignore that, and I go over here to do something I can do anytime, any day. Are you getting this? We've been given a once-in-a-lifetime invitation to the greatest celebration of all time. But dear friends, are we in danger of ignoring it? Are we in danger of taking it for granted? Are we in danger of, you know, just insulting it? Are we so busy doing the other things of this life around here that we're, the, that we're ignoring the invitation and that we're not making our salvation sure. You say, but I'm here in church, pastor. You're like, man, I'm here. You're preaching to the choir. You didn't be talking to the folk that aren't here. Well, I wish I could talk to them. I really do. I pray for them. But... You're here in body. But are you really here? Now, I'll get to that a little bit more, more a little later on in the message. But just so we understand how serious this invitation is and our response to it, Jesus makes it sure that we know that rejecting the gospel invitation leads to destruction. When the Jews rejected him, in Matthew 23, Jesus said their house was left to them desolate. And you know that about 40 years later, the Romans came and they sacked Jerusalem, their city, and burned their temple. That's exactly what Jesus said. That's verse 7. It came about there in the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And, and if we ignore the invitation of salvation, if, if we cherish other things in our hearts, Dear friends, we're going to end up the same way. God loves us too much not to tell us. Let's continue in verses 8 through 10, though. The big idea in these verses here, verses 8 through 10, but let's read them first. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. You know, again, this may be an obvious thing to all of us, but Jesus is emphasizing this here. In these verses, the big idea is that salvation is offered freely to everyone. This was one of the game changers that Jesus shocked his hearers with. The Jewish leaders were so confident in their status as God's chosen people that they felt that the privilege of salvation was exclusively theirs. In fact, they felt like it didn't even matter what they did and whether they appreciated it or not. They could not lose the privilege because after all, Abraham is my father. So, we see that unfortunately the Jews' leadership as a nation, not as individuals, but as a nation, refused the gospel invitation. Jesus was standing right in front of them. He was pleading with them. He was warning them. He was giving some of their final invitations and he was pleading with them, but they refused them. In fact, in the story, the king says that they were not worthy. And even though they were invited at first, they proved ungrateful for and therefore unworthy of the invitation. And it makes me think about ourselves, the Seventh-day Adventists, because a lot of times I think 
Maybe we get into that same mode. We have been blessed with the message of Bible truth and picture of the character of God and and the understanding of the great controversy and what God is doing. We have been blessed beyond all people. And we get here and we think, well, we have the Sabbath. And so we're special. And maybe we start to get all like the Jews a little bit. We're privileged and it doesn't matter what we do as long as I get in that pew on Sabbath. But the king, because they were ungrateful, the king said they're unworthy. And the interesting thing, the next thing he said was, next thing he said was, go into the highways and as many as you find, invite them. As many as you find, invite them. In other words, the invitation is now open to everyone. It's open to everyone. Going into the highways for them, it represented going outside the city of Jerusalem and going to the Gentiles with the message. Jesus is emphasizing the radical idea for them that salvation is not only for the Jews, but now it's for all nations and races and tribes and tongues that they are all invited to share in the privileges and blessings of salvation. So the king's servants go out and they gather everyone that they can find and they bring them to the wedding. And they're not very discriminating about it, which is the way it should be. They bring in everybody they find because the Bible tells us, number three in your notes, the church is filled with both what? Good and bad. That's what it was there. All kinds of it. And so we are to give the invitation and anyone can respond and we are not the judge of their hearts or their motives. Isn't that right? And so there are all kinds of church, uh, people in the church. There are some very, very sincere folk in the church. And there are also some not so very sincere folk in the church. But it's not our job to judge. And, and so even though you said earlier, Pastor, you're preaching to the choir, you should be talking to the people who aren't here. I would suspect that even in our audience, as much as I would like to say that we're all sincere, maybe, maybe there's one or two that I get to talk to today, that God has really wanted to talk to, that the Holy Spirit is, is ministering to and pleading with, take this seriously. You've been invited, you've been given a great invitation, what are you doing with it? It's not our job to judge. It's our job to give the invitation to everyone and bring them into the king's presence and fill up his wedding hall with the people he loves. That's what he wants because he loves everybody. And so a final insight to wrap up this section. Now follow this. Now just chew on this one for a minute here. Those you think are in are out. And those you think are out, are in. Imagine what a game changer that was for the people that were listening to Jesus. For them to be confronted with the idea that those who thought they were guaranteed the kingdom, Abraham is our father, those who were guaranteed the kingdom were out, And that those whom they knew could never make it were actually in. That was mind-blowing for them. But here's the thing, dear friends. Realizing that can change the game for you and for me too. Because it should warn us against becoming self-confident and self-righteous, shouldn't it? And as I said, sometimes... We Adventists, because we have been so blessed sometimes, we get a little bit that way. A little bit self-righteous, a little bit self-confident. We have a message. You know, it's just, I don't know. I don't know if I should go here. We have the message. But our lives often do not reflect that message. 
and people out there in churches that are on the wrong day many times are living a more humble, more submitted, more holy Christian life than we are who have the message. And I don't want to encourage you to go out there and look for it there. That's a shame. We should be able to find it here. Of all professing Christians, we're told, Seventh-day Adventists should be foremost in uplifting Christ before the world and demonstrating His transforming power in our lives. So let's not be self-confident. Because the moment we get that way, The moment we get like that about being in, (laughs) we're out. So I want to share something to help us sort of balance this. Wonderful statement, Christ's Object Lessons. You read the chapter in Christ's Object Lessons about this, uh, this story, the wedding feast. Great chapter. God is love. He has shown that love in the gift of Christ. Dear friends, the clearest revelation of the incredible love of God was made when He came down here and lived among us in the person of His Son and went and hung on that cross and died for us. That is love that we cannot even begin to fathom. Isn't that true? Can't even begin to... God is love and He showed us that love in the gift of Christ. But, now here's the balance. The love of God does not lead Him to excuse sin. He expects us to overcome in His name. A certain medieval monk announced that he would be preaching that evening on the love of God. And so the people came to to hear this message on the love of God. What what more can be said and what's he going to say? And, and so evening was coming and the shadows were falling and the light ceased to stream in through the, light, uh, the windows of the cathedral. And the people were sitting there waiting for the monk and what was he going to say? Well, in the darkness of, of, of the church, the monk lit a candle and he carried it over to where the statue of Jesus on the cross was. He carried it over there. And first of all, he took that candle and he held it up to the thorn-pierced brow of the Savior. And then after a few moments, he took the candle and he held it over on the nail-scarred hands. And then he held it over to the nail-pierced feet. And then he took the candle and held it up to the spear-wounded side. And after people had looked at all those things, after he shone the candle on that spear-wounded side, he blew the candle out and left the church. There was nothing else to say. Everything was demonstrated in what Jesus did. Nothing else to say. Oh yes, the love of God is too amazing for us to understand. But there is responsibility too. And that's the balance of what Jesus is bringing together here. It's an awesome wedding feast and the king has made all the preparations. All you have to do is show up. But there's responsibility too. Don't excuse sin in your life. Because God doesn't excuse it. Now God forgives sin. Sin that's repented of. Sin that we say, God, I want to turn away from this. God loves to forgive that and wash us clean from that. But God does not excuse sin. Sin that we hang on to. Sin that we cherish. Don't excuse it in your life because God does it. Verses 11 to 14. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away. and Cast him into outer darkness and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. 
The generous king comes in to see the guests who've been favored by his hospitality, and he sees a man without a wedding garment. Now the implication here is that the king, at great effort and personal expense to himself, had provided a garment worthy of the occasion of the wedding of his son for every guest to wear so that they would be acceptable to be in the feast. The king provided even the garment, folks. But, last big point, you have to be dressed to attend. You have to be dressed to attend. To not wear the garment in the story was to deliberately dishonor the wedding feast, the son, and the king himself. And the Bible tells us that the king came in to see the guests. It's not our place to judge. We give the invitation. But the king comes in to see the guests. He's checking everyone at the feast that they have a right to be there. And that right, you see, is conditional upon two things. Accepting the invitation first and having on the wedding garment second. What's the lesson? Lesson is this. First of all, God does have a judgment process. God is rich in mercy and in grace, but He does not excuse sin either. God is patient and loving and kind. You know, I mean, the king could have come right in if he wanted to, and, and, and you know, well, I'll get to that. I don't want to get too far ahead of my sermon. But he doesn't excuse sin either. You see, sin is what caused this whole mess in the universe that you and I are dealing with. Sin is what started it off. And so how would God, now follow me, how would God all of a sudden overlook it in those who supposedly want a place in his kingdom? If sin is what split heaven up, if sin is what caused the mess and can't be there, why would God now all of a sudden overlook it in those who say they want the place in the kingdom? He's not going to, dear friends. You see, this, we need to understand, is the pre-advent judgment process that's been going on since 1844. Yes, we should celebrate the joy of our salvation and the assurance. But should we remember that we are also living in sober and serious times? Yes, we should. Should we be serious about saying, God, work in my life. Help me be more like you. Help me love what you love. Help me not love the things of the world. Should we be serious about that, folks? Yes, we are living in a time of judgment. Now, next of all, to be worthy for the wedding, we must have the garment. Now, the man, at the, fe- the man at the feast without the garment had a problem. Without the garment, he could not be there. He did not have a right to be there. Now, I cannot emphasize the importance of what Jesus is trying to teach us right here. So the question is, what is that garment that is so vital? Listen, I want to share with you something else here. Only the covering which Christ himself has provided can make us meet to appear in God's presence. This covering, what's the garment? This covering, the robe of his own righteousness, Christ will put upon every repenting, believing soul. Hallelujah. Every repenting, believing soul. Christ will give me that robe of his righteousness. Let's go on. I love what it says next. This robe, woven in the loom of heaven, has in it not one thread of human devising. Oh, hallelujah. It's not of you, it's of Jesus. There's not one thread of human devising in that robe of righteousness. Christ in his humanity wrought out a perfect character, and this character he offers. He offers to impart to us. The necessary garment to be at the wedding is the perfect character of Jesus Christ, which he has provided freely, by the way, at infinite effort and cost to himself. 
The king provided the wedding garment for the guests. God has provided the wedding garment that you and I need to be at that marriage supper of the Lamb. But notice in verse 12, when the king came to see the guests and saw the man without the garment, the king did not just kick the man out of the feast right away. He didn't say, oh, oh. That's not what the king did. He asked him how he got there without a garment. In other words, he gave him an opportunity to explain. He, he, he was showing him mercy and showing him kindness. He was like, let's figure this out. You know, you got the invitation. How, how could you be here without the garment? I, I want to help you with this. In other words, what I want us all to understand is that God, even though he doesn't excuse sin, God is willing to forgive. He is merciful. He is gracious. He is looking for every reason to save people. God is not willing, the Bible tells us, that any should perish. That's right. But that all should be saved. And he makes every effort and he offers every opportunity for that to happen. But the Bible tells us that the man was what? Speechless. He had nothing to say. He had, in other words, no excuses. The garment was provided. It was there for him. All he had to do was take it, put it on. He had no excuses. Why? Because he had deliberately chosen to ignore the garment that was provided. I, I, I don't know why he would do that. I mean, when the king gives you a, a present like that, you would kind of want it. But, you know, may, maybe he thought that his own garment was superior. And maybe he wanted to show it off to, to the other guests that were there. He wanted to see how great his garment may, Maybe he thought the one he had was good enough and he didn't really need that one. But it wasn't a matter. It was, it was what the king provided. And it was an insult to the king not to wear it. The man without the garment represents professed Christians who feel no need to have their characters changed. Dear friends, we have nothing. Let me say that again. We have nothing suitable of our own to wear in the presence of God. Nothing suitable. She said there is not one thread of human devising in that robe that we must wear that Christ offers us. We have nothing suitable. We are only acceptable when clothed in the gift of Christ's righteousness. And since the man had no excuse, Jesus says in the story that he was unfortunately cast out. Number four, if you're following along, without Christ's righteousness, we will be lost. Now, I, I want to get into this with you a little bit. I want to parse this out. I want to talk about Christ's righteousness. Christ's righteousness is given to us in two ways. Now, you may have heard a couple of words in this conversation about righteousness by faith. We talk about imputed righteousness, and we also talk about imparted righteousness. So first of all, when we get the righteousness of Christ, it's imputed to us. What does the word imputed mean? Imputed means that we are declared as being a certain way when we're really not that way. So in other words, what it means is when Christ, when God imputes Christ's righteousness to us, it's that me, I'm a sinner, I'm a messed up person, Jesus died for me, and I reach out and by faith I accept his, the gift of his life and his shed blood, and I accept it by faith and make him my savior. Even though I'm a messed up sinner, God looks at me and he imputes Christ's righteousness to me and says, you're perfect. You're holy. Okay? So imputed righteousness is, is God telling me that, that it means that I'm given something that even though nothing in my life reflects it. Does that make sense for you? You following that? Okay. In other words, we're declared righteous when we know ourselves we're really not righteous. We're kind of messed up. But now second of all, Christ's righteousness is also imparted to us. 
Now, imparted righteousness means that Jesus begins to work in my life when I come to him and I give my heart to him. He begins to work to incorporate his character into my daily life so that I actually begin to be changed into his righteousness and, and his righteousness in, and I change into his character and so that his righteousness actually begins to be reflected and practiced in my life. Do you follow that? So imputed righteousness is God telling me I'm holy when I'm not. Imparted righteousness is the process where Jesus now begins to actually change me so that I begin to become holy. So that he helps me overcome sin in my life and gives me victory. Notice the last sentence of the quote that I put up there earlier. It says, Christ in his humanity wrought out a perfect character and this character he offers to what? impart to us. This is what we have to understand about this garment. If we just want to stop with imputed and hang out there and go no further, we're in trouble. Because Christ's righteousness has its two sides of one coin, imputed and imparted. You cannot separate them. Okay? Uh, uh, so the character that he offers to make an actual part of our daily lives, an actual part of our experience. It's his character. In other words, he wants to help us gain the victory over the sins that beset us. We talk about justification and sanctification. This is the sanctification process. Dear ones, God has done everything to provide the feast for us and to make it possible for us to be there. He's even provided the garment. But we have a responsibility as well to take sin seriously and let Jesus give us the victory over it. Unfortunately, the church of today dwells upon God's grace and forgiveness to the exclusion of obedience and victory over sin. The man without the garment is the condition of many folk in the church today. They want the blessings and the privileges of the gospel and all the nice stuff that goes along with it, but they don't want to repent and turn away from sin and develop a righteous Christ-like character. They are joining up to the world and, and its lifestyle and its practices, but still coming and sitting in the pews of the church every week. And so my question is, are you and I daily seeking by Christ's grace and power to experience the imparted righteousness of Jesus, to have victory over sin in our lives? And I want to say this, remember, it is impossible. Obedience is impossible by ourselves. Are you hearing me? Obedience is impossible by ourselves. But Jesus proved that humanity and divinity combined, in that context, obedience is possible. Humanity and divinity combined. By, by the way, that's a marriage, it's a wedding. It happened in Jesus. And it's the proof that when humanity and divinity combine, obedience becomes possible, not because we do it, but because Jesus does it. How? I want to share with you the beautiful answer. This is awesome. I love this. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with His heart. The will is merged in His will. The mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. You see, it's, it's not talking about, oh, I accepted Jesus and got baptized once a long time ago. It's talking about a daily experience, isn't it, dear friends? It's talking about daily giving Him control of our hearts and minds and letting Him live His life in us. That's why I'm so glad we sang that song, All to Jesus 
I surrender. That's what having the imparted righteousness of Christ is about. It's a deeper and deeper experience of surrender in our lives to Him. It's letting Him have control of our hearts and minds until He can live His life out within us. Over in New York, on, on Fifth Avenue, there's, there's a couple of interesting statues. And there, there was a, a, a pastor that, that people you know, would often come and, and he'd be trying to help them. They'd be wrestling with, with this relationship with Jesus and having the assurance of their salvation and so on. And, and particularly, it often boiled down to this point of surrender. And, and so he could talk to them, but, but he found that really to try to illustrate it, it was really better to show them an example. And so he would take them out of his office and they'd walk down along um, Fifth Avenue in New York and they would come to a statue of, of, of Charles Atlas. Now, you know Charles Atlas, right? This, in his Greek mythology, you know, there's this guy, this, this amazing specimen uh, of the male body, rippling muscles, not a shred of fat, and just perfectly formed, powerful muscles. And, and Atlas is doing what? He's carrying the world on his shoulders. And that statue of Charles Atlas, this, this powerful, magnificent specimen of the best that hu the human body could be, is just, you know, just crushing under the load of carrying the world on his shoulders. And he let them look at that and, and kind of absorb that. And then the pastor would take them across the street to where St. Patrick's Cathedral was. And, and there in the cathedral was a statue of Jesus as a little boy. And standing there, Jesus as a little boy, holding in his hand effortlessly, was the world. And the pastor would show them and let them absorb that. And he would say, now, he said, here's the issue of surrender. The surrender is the choice between Charles Atlas trying to carry the world himself or Jesus. And surrender for you is the choice of you. Are you going to try to carry your world yourself? Are you going to try to carry your sin and deal with your sin and your life on your own shoulders? Or you can say, Lord... I give up. I give it up to you, Lord. I give you my life. I give you my world. And you let Jesus carry it effortlessly in the palm of his hand. Now, last of all in Scripture, the man is cast into outer darkness. He's lost. And so as I wrap this up, the last uh, lesson that I think we could learn here, dear ones, and I appeal to you, I just make this appeal. Be sure, once you're in, you don't go out. Be sure, once you're in, you don't go out. The man entered the hall by the king's invitation, but he was cast out of the hall by his own choice. What does that mean? It means we cannot save ourselves. We are invited into salvation by the King Himself and through Jesus Himself. But we can cause ourselves to be lost by our choices. Choices to excuse sin in our lives. Choices not to overcome it. Choices not to ask Jesus to give us His imparted righteousness. Because it's not one thread of our own devising. It's not our own effort. It's simply the surrender to say, Jesus, you get it all. You live in me. You live out your life. Today, right here in Laodicea, this is a wake-up call. This is a game changer. Let's make sure in our lives we are not undressed. Let's make sure in our lives that we don't get caught without the wedding garment. Don't be in church, but not in Christ. To remind you of something my, my wonderful colleague Godwin said in his TED Talk message last week, you're, on the, you're in the premises, but you're not in the presence. Right? Same thing. Make sure that we're not in church, or we're in church, but not in Christ. Don't presume to think that the grace of Christ will cover sin that we cherish and that we excuse. 
This is a game-changing call for you and I to stop coasting as Christians in our spiritual lives. And believe me, in my own life as your pastor, God has given me a big-time wake-up call. I don't have time to get into that now. But this is not. This is a time to stop coasting in our spiritual life. It's a time. It's a wake-up call to stop skipping our daily devotions and going light on sin. This is a game-changing call to give it all to Jesus, to surrender to Him. All to Jesus, I surrender. To submit the sins we cherish and let Him give us the victory, knowing that it's only so that we can be at the greatest wedding feast of all time. It's a call. For you and I to make doubly sure that I am in Christ, not just in the church. And that I will seek to have His character. Why? Why? Because we are invited to the ultimate wedding feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Why? Because He's coming as King of kings and Lord of lords. He's coming again. And when He comes... Don't get caught undressed. Don't get caught undressed. Don't let anything keep you from that wedding feast that's been provided for you.